Hello, this is a brief video about some small computer trainers based on various 8-bit microprocessors that are designed and produced by this gentleman in Thailand. And uh, he's got a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Physics. And he teaches um, at a university in Thailand. And he has a whole, let's see, Faculty of Science Associate Dean um, and some other positions. Anyway, he has a whole series of these microprocessor projects. Uh, they're all very similar and they're available as kit and some of them are av available as pre-assembled as well. Um, He's got one based on the 1802 microprocessor, one on the 8086, the 6809, the 68008, the 8088, the 8080, the 8051, otherwise known as the MCS51. Did I say 8051? I think I did. <laughs> the 6802, the Z80, the 6502 and the 8085. For each one of these he's got a nice uh, photo available, specifications, schematics, manuals all available to download from his website. They all use the same basic design. He also has an eBay uh, store which is under this name. He's been selling these since about 2010. And according to this he's sold um, looks like approximately 150 so far of these kits. Uh, although so far I can only see the assembled versions of the kits on eBay. He definitely is currently selling the 8088, the 68008, the 1802, and the 6809. Let's see, see all items. So, Z80, 68008, 8086, 1802, 80, so you can see here that there's quite a few of them available. I bought the 1802 kit just out of curiosity. The prices are all kind of in the neighborhood of $150 for these. Some are a little bit more, some are a little bit less. And the um, unassembled versions are typically maybe 20 bucks cheaper. There's not a huge saving for getting the, um, the kit version. It's mostly just you would build it as an educational step and maybe a student would be uh, given a kit so they gain extra familiarity with what they're building from a hardware standpoint but if you just want to get the assembled ones this is a pretty economical price considering the labor that goes into building them I don't know if the gentleman builds them personally or maybe he has some of his students build them no idea Anyway, so this video is about, about the uh, 1802 version specifically, and uh, from that you can extrapolate what the other ones are like. Here's the 1802 computer, as provided, assembled, and bought on eBay. It has some basic features. It has uh, the ability to run off of a, a power supply using a barrel connector. Um, there is no specific power supply recommended, nor does one come with the product, whether you buy it assembled or as a kit. Um, I used a fairly generic wall wart type power supply that gives a regulated 9 volt output. These are all designed for 9 volt power. And uh, this one's 1.3 amp, although I think uh, the maker of the kit recommends that these be powered by a power supply of approximately one amp to have enough capacity under uh, maximum power consumption. So this is a nice inexpensive power supply. 
is adequate to the task. Now one thing that wasn't available at the time I bought mine was any information on the size of the barrel connector. Um, I think he's added that information now and I think all of his different versions of this product use the same barrel connector but uh, essentially um, I bought this supply making a guess at what the barrel connector dimensions were going to be and it turned out to be appropriate. Um, this particular one has an outer diameter of 5.5 millimeters and the specified inner diameter is 2.1 millimeters which is bigger than the the center pin that's in there but it works just fine and then the length is of the metal part is 11 millimeters I think a 10 millimeter would also work that's a common size uh, so that's an important piece of information to get a suitable power supply then there's a DB9 connector for RS-232 and it's true RS-232 with the plus and minus 12 volt uh, signal swings. Um, this display does not come with the kit whether you buy it assembled or as a kit. I had to buy this separately and the uh, maker of the kit only states that any LCD display compatible with the Hitachi HD44780 controller will work with this kit. This display that I bought is from New Haven Display in Elgin, Illinois. It's just one that I picked sort of randomly and it uses a competing but compatible controller chip, the ST as in Tom 7066U uh, but looking that up on the web, it's compatible with the HD44780, which is a classic Hitachi controller for this type of display. And this display is um, 16 characters wide by one, char one character high, so one row of 16 characters wide. So here's the 1802. I think that's the intersil version of the part. And then there's a... Uh, 8250 on there, there's an EEPROM, there's a RAM chip, the ever popular 62256, I think that's 32K by 8. Uh, there's a GAL chip here, a Gatorade Logic, and that is to reduce the parts count on the board. Uh, in this case it seems to be primarily used just to decode the various addresses uh, so there's not a lot of glue logic on the board for decoding addresses. It's all just done right in this one chip. And then this chip here is the level shifter for the RS-232 and it's got the supporting capacitors which are used as charge pumps to get the plus and minus 12 volts um, so that it's true RS-232. Uh, you've got your power supply over here with a power LED um, and there's a tick generator that I think most of these have. This one certainly does. And it's just a built-in clock that produces a tick every 10 milliseconds. And um, the interrupt pin of the IC of the microprocessor can be selected to either go off the tick or off of another interrupt source so it gives you some flexibility for testing interrupts. Uh, there's the connector for the LCD. Um, one curious thing about this kit is it did not come with the label over the window on the EEPROM which normally you'd need to have uh, to prevent accidental erasure from um, you know if you put it near a window it could get enough UV to erase it so I just stuck something on there temporarily. Uh, another thing these kits all have is a bank of eight LEDs uh, which are addressed to a particular address in this case it's 7000 hex and that's just for testing programs it's essentially a little output port um, makes it convenient that's a nice feature since the 1802 has the Q output this particular kit also has a dedicated yellow LED 
tied to the Q output so you can test that and programs that use it accordingly. Uh, there's also a trim potentiometer here for uh, adjusting the uh, contrast signal into the LCD if you have one hooked up. And uh, then these chips here are for driving the LED display which is the primary user interface. And then the keyboard is not a membrane keyboard even though it looks like one. It's actually a bunch of uh, tactile switches down here. They're fairly large ones. And then it's, uh, as the maker says, it's some adhesive back uh, printable paper that he's using. And he just says it's stuck over. And that's more than a lot of people do when they have kits like this. I give him kudos for uh, doing this. It's still a little clunky. The edges kind of fold over. It would have been nice if there had been some sort of a, a little rail put under the edges of this to help support that a little better. And because it's adhesive, you can kind of hear that annoying sound whenever you push the buttons. But it is functional. It works well enough. Um, this kit uses two display modules of four characters each. They're all seven segment. And it's only using the uh, leftmost four for addressing and then two digits of the rightmost for for data. Um, some of the other characters may be used for certain prompts, but nominally all you're using is the leftmost six digits of this. Now possibly on the version that works at the 68008, um, since I believe that has a, a much wider uh, number of uh, bits, it may be a 16-bit processor. I didn't look it up, but I wanted to say it was. And maybe these extra digits are used for that purpose on that particular kit. All the other ones are 8 bits. So, um, basic uh, functionality here. These buttons on the left are primarily related to working with a terminal emulator program running on your PC, for example, connected by RS-232, and uh, you can copy programs, you can dump memory from here to the connected computer, or load memory from the connected computer. So that's your only real way of storing and retrieving programs that you might write on this. Um, it's got the hexadecimal keypad, and because the 1802 has 16 um, internal 16-bit registers, which is something most processors don't have, uh, there are shifted functions for most of these keys um, from R3 through R15, which is really RF, and R14 is RE. He's showing them in decimal here, but uh, the 1802 would, you know, treat those in hexadecimal as it does everything else. Um, registers 0, 1, and 2, which would normally go on these uh, keys here, are used by the monitor program normally, so there's no key for those. Uh, over here, and this area tends to be pretty uh, much dialed into the type of processor you're using, so there's a lot of peculiar things that are going to be different about this part of the keypad. There is of course a reset. Uh, because there's the QLED, there's a button associated with the QLED. It's just for testing it, I think. It doesn't seem to toggle it on and off. Uh, the user memory starts at 8000 hex, or 800 hex. And this PC button here uh, takes you directly to that starting address so you don't have to type it in. It's a nice way after you've just entered your program you can hit that to go back to the beginning of the program. Um, there's the go button that executes the code wherever the program counter is currently pointing whether it's 8000 hex or something else. There's a user button here which I think is uh, available for whatever you want it to be used for. Then there's the int here, which is tied into 
uh, the interrupt input of the 1802 through this switch. So if you've got this switch in the int mode, then pushing the int button will run to the interrupt. Otherwise, it's the tick. Um, the 1802 has four single bit inputs, EF1 through EF4, uh, and uh, those are, two of them are brought out here to buttons. So you can use those to test programs that use those inputs. Uh, the, I see, I already mentioned that. This is insert here, so you can insert a byte into an existing program and everything else gets shifted. Delete will delete the current byte and everything below it gets shifted up. Uh, plus and minus increments and decrements the address that's currently on the display. Address allows you to enter an address. Data allows you to enter data at the current address. The register key is essentially the shift key for all these buttons, allowing you to look at any register that's over a normal key. So R3 through R15 in this case, or the D register, which is the 1802's version of the accumulator. It's an 8-bit register, whereas the rest of these are 16-bit registers. Uh, so I think I've basically covered most of that. Oh yeah, there's also a, a, a little speaker on the back, right here. And I believe that's controlled by the Q output. We'll study the schematic and find out. Um, but uh, if you don't want that, you can push this and turn the uh, speaker off. So now let's look over, over here, and there's this uh, header, and this is essentially an expansion header that you can use to plug in your own experimental circuits. So all the critical control signals, address, data bus, that type of thing gets wired out here. On some of them that have, uh, for example, the uh, 8051, which is actually a microcontroller, not a microprocessor per se, on uh, the kit for that one, uh, at least one of the 8-bit ports on the microcontroller is brought out to these pins. Um, so that will differ a lot from each version of the kit to the next version, as does the details on the keyboard. So here is the uh, three-page schematic. Here's the 1802. Um, most of its single bit inputs are pulled high through a resistor network to uh, positive 5 volts, including EF1 through EF4, which are up here, uh, and then also the DMA out, the weight, the interrupt, the uh, DMA input, and the clear input. And the clear input's brought to a test point on the board so you can access it easily. The data bus is also pulled high through a resistor network. And the 1802, while it uses 16-bit addresses, it only has an 8-bit address port on the chip, so it has to send out the low byte and the high byte on separate cycles. And so there's this IC here for latching in the uh, high byte, and otherwise the low byte comes out directly. So let's see, um, there's a crystal oscillator and there's the various memory control and cycle status lines that some are used, some are not. Let's see, all the power supply development here uses 7805, so it converts the 9 volt coming in uh, from the wall wart power supply into 5 volts. And there's the power LED. And, uh, let's see, actually, I've got it backwards here. Here's the 9 volt coming in. It's diode protected, so if you plug it in backwards, it will not damage anything. Then you've got the LED right on the 9 volt side of the regulator, and then the 5 volt regulated sides out here. Um, the QLED comes right off the Q signal on the 1802, drives the LED through this buffer. The reset button 
here is also tied in to a uh, voltage uh, supervisory chip. This is uh, quite common now. If the supply voltage is not appropriate, then it'll force the processor into reset rather than having it run in a uh, state where it would be unreliable because the supply voltage is marginal. And then there's also a RC network here which also provides power on reset. So any of those three things can provide a reset. And then of course that goes to the reset input of the uh, 1802 and there's an inverted and non-inverted version of that available on the circuit. Uh, here are the buttons for EF1 and EF2. Here's the interrupt push button and the selector switch that picks that or the tick signal to go to the interrupt input of the 1802. Um, I think this is the schematic symbol that's intended for that header expansion header so it's saying that um, D0 through D7 are available there. Uh, the monitor program resides from 0000, 000, 000, 000 hex to 0 FFF and the 32k RAM is from 8000 hex to 8 FF or I'm sorry to FFFF 32 kilobyte um, static RAM chip and uh, let's see here's the Oh, this is a little microcontroller that's on the board, and it's uh, charged with doing a few things, also to replace some glue logic. And um, one of the things it does is provides the tick pulse. And then there's also a status LED and a test point associated with it. And then over here is the CPU expansion connector. I guess that's not what this means after all, because this is the connector there. Uh, so let's see, what else do we have on here? Oh, here's the uh, the GAL, the Gate Array Logic. Uh, it takes in the various memory control signals as well as various address signals. And from that, it decodes various memory locations. For example, it provides the chip enable for the ROM, the chip enable for the RAM, the RAM write enable. It provides the uh, single address enable for the um, the eight LEDs that are on the circuit board, which is being called GPI01. Provides the enable signal for the LCD, and then there is ports zero, one, and two, and the UART, which was that. Um, larger chip on here. So that takes care of the first page. And here's how the uh, display is set up. You've got your latch here which takes the data and it's driven off that port 2 signal which we got from here and that drives the decimal point and the seven segments of the uh, matrix scanned LED display and then another chip doing essentially the same thing it's the same kind of chip it's an 8-bit latch now uses the port 1 as its chip enable and it's doing the rows or the digits of the matrix scan It seems that this digit is not used at all. It's not connected on the board. And this one here has got a jumper um, so you can turn it on and apparently use it in some way. And then um, another chip here is used to interface with the matrix scanned keyboard. And then over here is the uh, speaker signal and the single transistor to drive the speaker. And then there's some different resistor arrays there. Uh, 
And then finally, um, this is the LCD interface header and the contrast adjustment potentiometer. Here's another 8-bit uh, latch I see. This one's selected by the GPI-01 signal and used to latch data out to drive those 8 LEDs. Instead of giving them each their own current limiting resistor, they're just going into a zener which provides uh, a fixed voltage reference point um, so that you don't have so much voltage drop and you don't then need to have the current limiting resistors because the voltage coming out of here and the voltage here is only slightly greater than the nominal forward voltage of these LEDs so that's a convenient way of doing it. Then here's the UART and once again it's got its control enable signal coming from the address decoder GAL chip and it provides things like the transmit and receive signals which then come down here to the RS-232 level shifter IC and uh, that's the whole schematic. I should mention that the dimensions on these boards has just enough clearance for the typical two-line version of this LCD display whose circuit board comes down just a little further right to the top of the LED display. Uh, this single line one isn't quite so tall so the circuit board has got a little bit more of a gap here but it'll work with either single line or dual line uh, versions of this type of display. So um, my power turned on now and I'm going to plug in my power supply and this flickering here is just due to the uh, strobe effect I'm getting from the frame rate on my video recorder uh, combined with the uh, different uh, matrix scan of the LEDs. So in reality this is a very stable display. It's not flickering like this. It just looks that way on the video. And to prove that the LCD that's connected is working on power up or on reset it displays this message but there's nothing in the monitor program to send any other information to the display if you want to control the LCD on here it's just like controlling the speaker or controlling these LEDs or anything else you have to write your own program to do that the monitor that's always running on here only controls this display besides this power up message so I have a little program here I'm going to enter just to demonstrate how this works. And this is a uh, classic program for operating the QLED on the 1802 ELF computer. And then it gets extrapolated to other versions of the uh, 1802 based computers. So um, I've adjusted it to work with the QLED on here and all I really had to do is relocate the memory because the original version of this was assuming to start at address 0000 instead of 8000. So since the program starts there I'm just going to go here and push the PC button which immediately takes me to the start of user memory and the two decimal points there means that when I enter something these are the digits that are going to change. So, um, actually I'm going to go in here and put in a different address. I'm going to push the address button, and now it puts the decimal points here. So I could put in 0000, and look at what's in there. Now this is part of the monitor program. So that's how that works. And then I could increment by pushing the plus button, and look through memory. Now if I don't like the speaker I can push this and then when I push the button the speaker doesn't beep. And then it toggles it back on when I push it again. So now that I've demonstrated that I'm going to go to the PC button bring myself back to 8000 hex 
and start entering my program. I've got uh, 7a plus f8 one zero b three two three nine three three a zero four three one zero zero 7b, 30, and 01. Ending at 800c correctly. So now I'm going to push the PC button and go back here and take a look at this and go through and make sure I didn't make any mistakes. So 7a, f8, 10, b3, 23, 93, 3a, 0, 4, 3, 1, 0, 0, 7, B, 3, 0, 0, 1. Going back to 8,000 and pushing the Go button, which flashes the QLED. Now the way this program works, of course, is it's doing a time delay and toggling the Q output on and off. And this particular piece of information here is a value that gets loaded into the high byte of a 16-bit word and then decremented until that 16-bit word is uh, zero or nearly zero. And that's how the time delay is accomplished. So if I want to make the time delay longer, I just have to increase this value. So I'm going to push reset here, and that stops and returns me to the power on prompts. So now I'm going to go to address 8002 and I'm going to push the data button. The decimal points move under here so I know I'm changing that and I'm going to go to a much larger value of 50. I'm pushing PC to go back to the start of the program and pushing go and now I can see that the QLED is flashing much slower. So that's one example of how this works. Here's another quick little program to demonstrate another feature of this kit. This does the same thing as the Q flasher LED I put in. It's ever so slightly shorter, one byte shorter, but it does use a built-in feature of the monitor program which is a built-in time delay which can save you some steps uh, in various programs. So I'm going to enter that in real quickly. I'm going to push reset, PC to take me back to the start, and I'm going to start entering my program of F8, F0, B3, F8, 0, 1, a3, 7b, d3, 7a, d3, 30, and 0, 06. So now I'm going to run that program and there's a very similar result. But this time, instead of building my own time delay like the first version of the program, I'm now calling a subroutine, which is part of the kit's monitor program, and using the time delay that's built in there. So that's a handy thing. There's a built-in test function for these LEDs here. All I have to do is push the test button here, and they'll quickly count up in binary
and when it gets to the top it'll just wrap around starting from zero again and it's necessary to push reset to get out of there as an example of how to directly control these LEDs they are located at address 7000 hex or 700 hex so a simple program can be used to load the value of 7000 into register 4 it could be any register except for 0, 1, or 2 uh, because those are used by the monitor program and um, I should point out that you can use register 0 in a user program as long as you don't expect the monitor program to be running during that time uh, but just to keep out of its way I'm going to use register 4 here so I've loaded register 4 with the address of the LEDs and then this program here will um, allow me to load in some data and store it out to the LEDs at that address 7000 hex and then it will halt. The 1802 can halt with the 00 instruction and it won't do anything then until it's reset. Not all microprocessors have that handy feature. So I'm going to push PC I'm going to start entering my program which is F8 Seven zero B four F eight zero zero A four F eight zero one five four zero zero Okay, so now I can push PC to reset to 8000 hex, and I can push go, and it just turned on the first LED. And it did that because the data that I stored out there was a 0, 01 hex, which in binary is this pattern. If I wanted to change this, I can push reset and go and take a look at address 8007 hex address 8007 it's got that 01 uh, what if I were to put in a value of oh let's say AA and now I push um, PC to get back to there and do go and it turns on that pattern which of course is the binary pattern for hexadecimal AA So I think from this you can see that this is a pretty well designed, certainly well built, good quality components, pretty well thought out. Um, if there's anything really lacking on this that I wish it had, is I wish it had some more commands in it for support of the LCD, but then that's not really the point of this, it's to force students and experimenters to write machine code in the native language of the processor that's being supported by the various versions of this product and so it doesn't want to give you too much uh, help in the form of the monitor program and um, I think it would be nice if it had a little bit more IO on it like maybe a, a dip switch or something so you could you know enter some binary data and then input that as a port as it is, you've got the LED outputs to do the output version of that. I think it would be nice if it had an input equivalent of that. But uh, overall, this is a pretty nice product. And um, I think I would recommend it to anybody who's looking for some nicely done trainers that are readily available and reasonably priced. Hope you found this interesting. By the way, I have a separate video on YouTube that's all about programming this type of display. And in the video, I use this exact trainer to demonstrate some of the programming techniques. So um, you can see this device in action in that video as well as in this one.